Welcome to Que Pasa HSIs, a podcast dedicated to everything Hispanic serving institutions. I'm your host, Dr. Gina Ann Garcia, bringing you the news on what's happening in HSIs. Join us as we explore the history and evolution of HSIs, culturally relevant and liberatory practices, current and emerging research with HSIs, and the policies that shape servingness. Saludos, HSI familia. I'm excited to bring you the third episode of season two of Que Pasa, HSIs. As we enter Black History Month 2023, I want to remind us of the importance of honoring and acknowledging the contributions of all Black people, including African Americans, Afro Latines, Afro Caribbeans, and all Black people who are part of the African diaspora. And HSIs are not the exception. We should acknowledge and elevate Black students and educators during the month and beyond. I often say, don't be anti-Black in your servingness efforts, and I mean it. Being an HSI allows us to talk about racial equity, and racial equity includes a commitment to disrupting and addressing inequities experienced, experienced by Black people within HSIs. In the third episode, I had the pleasure of talking to Dr. Marcella G. Cuellar, who is an associate professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Davis. Her research examines higher education access and equity with the focus on Latinx, Latina, Latino student experiences and outcomes at HSIs and emerging HSIs, campus climate and community college baccalaureates. Her scholarship has been published in numerous journals, including the American Journal of Education, Community College Review, Review of Higher Education, and the Journal of Higher Ed. She is currently collaborating on a research project examining the role of the University of California as a Hispanic Serving Research Institution system, or HSRIs. Dr. Cuellar holds a BA in Psychology and Spanish from Stanford University, a MA in higher education leadership from the University of San Diego, and a PhD in higher education and organizational change at the University of California, Los Angeles. Originally from Oxnard, shout out to the 805, she is the proud daughter of Mexican immigrants. On a personal note, Marcela is one of my favorite scholar hermanas, and what I call my HSI side sister. We first met at UCLA in 2009 and became friends almost instantly. Eventually, our research around servingness and HSIs began to converge, making us professionally inseparable. We have collaborated in many ways and more recently served as co-guest editors of AERA Open for our special topic focused on intersectionality in HSIs. We are currently in the lab cooking up a few HSI projects that we will share with you when the time is right. But for now, enjoy this episode and enjoy learning from my brilliant friend, Marcella. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with today's episode of Que Pasa HSIs, where we talk about all things HSIs. I'm excited to have Dr. Marcela Cuellar with us today, the person I consider my HSI scholar side sister. We spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about and you know, just really advancing um, thinking around HSIs and serving us. So I'm excited to have you um, here today. But before we talk about HSIs, let's talk a little bit about you as our, our scholars and, and practitioners and folks tuning into the show today. They're, they're in higher ed and they like to, you know, know your journey. So tell us about your higher education journey. Yeah, well, first, I want to thank you for having me here uh, today, Gina, and I think it's exciting that you're putting this project together. Um, so just a little bit about me, you know, I, I'm originally from Oxnard, California, um, which is southern, just an hour north of Los Angeles along the coast, very much an agricultural community, particularly when I was growing up. And I always like to still say 805 in the house, um, because that is the area. Code Ooh, there. And shout out to 805. <laughs> something I'm extremely proud of and just feel blessed that this was the community that I was able to grow up in. And so for me, you know, being the youngest of six of a family of immigrants, um, my parents were farm workers when they first immigrated to this country. And then my dad did road construction. And so we were still very much a a low income family growing up in our community. And so for me, um, coming in as the sixth, I was able to benefit a lot from my siblings' knowledge. Um, So they taught me English before I went into elementary school. And that really kind of changed my trajectory that put me in a very different kind of experience from a lot of their own experiences. And I like to share that just because um, 
what we often see in, in education is that, or, or as I say, privilege begets privilege, right? And so I came in with a lot of like, I would say linguistic privilege uh, than my siblings. And that really put my education journey on a very different path. Um, and, but it was again, all thankful to them. And it was really a family um, contribution to my own educational pathways. So for me growing up in, in that community, I was tracked very early on into kind of these higher um, advanced placement courses gate. And that just kind of kept moving me through this pathway of, of, of having access to a lot of academic preparation. So for me, you know, I, I, I would say I was very much prepared for college by the time that I was graduating. But I didn't know a lot about college because my family, my siblings, um, only two of them had gone on to community college. Uh, that was what, uh, what we were familiar with, what we kind of knew, what was close in our community. Uh, but I was so fortunate that uh, in high school, I was um, able to get into the Upward Bound program. And it was really there that I really started to expand my understanding of the opportunities and possibilities of higher education. And that really pushed me on a track of like thinking about four-year colleges and going to college right after high school. So I was very fortunate to um, apply to various colleges uh, right out of high school. And uh, on a whim, I actually applied to Stanford University because I had heard that they had a really good psychology program. And I just came across that, you know, sitting with my friends in, in the library one day. And I thought, well, hey, why not? I, I'd like to go there. I didn't really have a sense of what that meant. <laughs> um, and so lo and behold, I got into Stanford, got into a couple other uh, universities in, in, the, in the area. But once I got that admission to Stanford, everyone said, you really have to take this opportunity. And so I went on this journey and I went to Stanford, which was six hours away from home. And so for me, really having that experience at Stanford it really opened my eyes to a lot of um, a lot of things. It opened my eyes, first of all, to a world that was very different from my own. Right, Stanford to, to Oxnard, such different uh, populations of people. Um, but it also really started to show for me um, the, the, the levels of inequities that there are in terms of academic preparation, socioeconomic status, but that this also provided a space where people from very different backgrounds could come together for the same goal in terms of like personal and professional development. And so for me, and so for me, that was also a very transformative experience. And it became for me at that moment, um, a, a real realization, right, that I knew there were a lot of tons of smart people in my community from Oxnard, but not everyone had access to the same opportunities and were not giving those opportunities, including being at a university like Stanford. And so for me, that really became the impetus for me in, in terms of thinking about access and equity. Um, how do I provide or start encouraging other students um, to become familiar with these opportunities and encourage them and provide the support necessary. So that led me into a career of outreach and advising, um, first in, in middle school in the Bay Area. And then that moved me, um, I eventually moved to San Diego where I was fortunate to kind of come full circle and become an upward bound counselor myself and working directly with high school students and encouraging their pathways and journeys towards higher education. And that really for me became the second place where I would say that really transformed my view on these issues of access and equity because several of my students, you know, all of my students actually, all of them were brilliant, talented, and uh, many of them went on to many different kinds of colleges, two year, four year. But I also started to see some of them um, either reverse transfer, meaning that they started at a four year, but then had to come back to the local community college or were taking longer to transfer or taking more time figuring out what to major in once they were in college or being pushed out of majors. And so for me, that kind of made me realize like, okay, this isn't just about access. How do we really think about what we're doing in higher ed, right? When we're, when we're sending such talent and making sure that we are changing structures in higher education to better support the students that, that we were sending from our program. And so for me, that kind of led me really to center higher ed. And so I really do see myself centered at this intersection of increasing access, but then once students are in college, how do we ensure that our institutions are supporting them and really doing these in ways that are asset oriented um, and taking responsibility on themselves and not just placing that responsibility on students.
Awesome. Thank you for telling us that story, that journey. I had never heard the story of the linguistic capital, right, that your that your siblings help you to provide um, provide you. What a powerful thing to say, right, that like, um, you know, there is a lot of privilege in even just speaking English as a multilingual person early on, right? And unfortunately, because our educational systems defer um, to that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that people don't just apply to Stanford on the whim, but you did. So, and, and got in, like, that's wild. People are probably listening like, what? <laughs> you applied on the whim? Um, let's not downplay that you were highly prepared, <laughs> obviously, for that for the, for that application process. So, um, so that's dope. I love it. I love that you, that you you, you know, that you look at it that way, right? That I applied to Stanford on the whim and yeah, I got in. Boom, I'll go to Stanford. Um, and shout out to the 805 because of course, like, you know, we both come from the 805, although I come from the much wider part of the 805 <laughs> than, than Oxnard. Oxnard was definitely much browner than my very white Simi Valley um, upbringing. Um, but somehow we found our, our ways to each other and, and, and continue to think a lot in the similar ways, right? About, about higher ed and about, and about journeys. Um, so tell us, us, back to Stanford. Stanford is not an HSI, not even close. We may be close now. It's hard not to be an HSI when you're in California. Yes. Uh, Emerging you're an, HSI. Okay. I was going to say, you have to try not to be an You actually have to actively try not to be an HSI when you're in California. Um, but back then, when you got in on a whim, <laughs> um, it wasn't an HSI, right? And definitely probably wasn't even emerging at that time. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that about your undergraduate experience, how you started thinking about surveyness. So tell us about your surveyness journey and how HSIs came into your consciousness. Definitely. So, so when I was in San Diego, I you know, was working as an upward bound counselor and then realized like it's time for me to go back to school if I want to continue to advance and and you know, at that point, I was thinking I want to become a higher ed administrator, right, because I want to change these institutions. And so I started a, a higher ed program at the University of San Diego. Uh, and it was there that I, I really started to think about higher ed more as like a field of study, um, taking classes on the history of higher ed. And and was really um, I think that's really when my like love for higher ed started in kind of this academic way. And so there I kind of remember some conversations about HSIs, right? This was back in 2005, 2006, you know, um, just kind of as if this was this, this thing, but I didn't really kind of think of it as like intersected necessarily with my work at that point in time. It really was when I went to UCLA uh, in 2007. And this is where, you know, um, this did become part of a conversation more in, in courses. And I think it really reflects more, you know, scholarship starting to come out at that point, right? Prior to that, there really wasn't a whole lot. So, so even though there was this idea, I, I knew that I wanted to study Latinx students, low-income first-gen students, but really didn't see the connection yet to HSIs. Um, again, reflecting some of the lack of where we were at the time, right, of, of that time period. But at UCLA, when I started my PhD program, we really started to see this as more of a conversation. And I was really fortunate at the time that um, I started UCLA, uh, my advisor, our advisor, uh, Dr. Silvia Hurtado, had actually gathered some data uh, through a, a large project that included a large number of, of Latinx students at HSIs. And so through that data set, you know, um, you know, was able, we were collaborating on something with that data set. Uh, she said, you know, I want you to look at these a little bit more closely. And, and then in my coursework, I really started to think about HSIs more as a context, really understanding now at that point that the majority of Latinx undergraduates, when they enroll in college, they are enrolling in institutions that are HSIs. And so that's when for me, the light bulb came on like, okay, if I really want to support Latinx students, and we know that at that time in particular, there was such little research still, that this is the place that I could really think deeply about supporting a greater number of Latinx students. So for me, that's really where, where that passion came. And also, as I started to develop um, studies during my PhD program, I, I started to, even in some of my interviews, students even if they weren't at an HSI, but they were at an emerging HSI, they had heard things about this and it was something that they would reference. And so for me, that really then further like made it concrete, like this is something to think about um, and what does this mean for students and their experiences? So that kind of led me to that journey in terms of an academic 
Then I also had the opportunity after I graduated from UCLA, I actually had a, a year as, a, as an adjunct and I adjunct at many different um, colleges in, in Southern California. And one of them was actually an HSI and I was teaching a first year seminar at this HSI. And for me that further cemented kind of the, the passion and commitment from a practical, more practitioner side being a faculty member. And, and when I had my class, it was half Latinx students from the local community. And that just really further affirmed, like this is where I want to really think more deeply for, for my entire agenda really, and my practice. Absolutely, almost like a full circle moment. Cause I mean, it's pretty much, it's in your community, right? Your home community. Yeah, yeah or very, very serendipitous at that time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your your research then, um, because, um, you know, thank you for telling us your servantness journey, because I think people enter this work for all kind of different reasons. Like none of us have the same reason why we passionately think about servingness and HSIs and their their place in the larger system of higher ed. Um, and your, your research, you know, comes at in, in multiple intersections, right? You study access and equity with the focus on Latinx, Latine, Latino students, student experiences and outcomes at Hispanic serving institutions and emerging HSIs, campus climate and community college baccalaureates. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about is um, the emerging part. And that's something that we haven't talked to any guests about. And I think it's an important thing to think about this, this, 10%, right? This 15 to, to 24%, right? That like where institutions are, are emer quote unquote emerging um, into this HSI um, status. And that is th a thread through your work, right? You often very much include and talk about the emerging um, process. So talk to us a little bit about the significance of including emerging HSIs in your research and, and you know, some of the things that you, you have found that you think we should continue to think about when it comes to the emerging process. Yeah, so for me, uh, emerging HSIs as a context, it really came up for me as part of a study. Um, I really wasn't thinking about this as a context, but uh, the institution where I was conducting a study was an emerging HSI based on their um, population. And it really was when I was interviewing students, they were referencing this notion of like, we know this institution is going to become an HSI, it's going to hit this percent. And then we're going to become an HSI. That that for me really um, started to signal like, okay, there is something that is already happening at this institution to signal that to students. And during that time was where um, we started to see the uh, Excelencia piece come out about emerging HSIs and really talking about these as an institutional context. And so I think those things converged for me at that moment. And what, what I think emerging HSIs um, why they 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 can be such a unique environment is because it is kind of um, kind of that uh, moment where institutions can intentionally think about some things before they even hit this designation. So either you could be passive about it, knowing that you're going to hit this designation, or you're going to be intentional about it and recognizing that someday, and like you said, in, in, Cal in a state like California, you almost have to try not to be an HSI. So for those that are emerging HSIs, you can either be passive about it or you could be intentional about it. And so if you are an emerging HSI, you can be thinking about how are you outreaching to Latinx communities? Are you thinking about serving this even early on and threading that not only when students are thinking about you, but all as students and families are thinking about your institution, but also um, what are you going to do once you become that HSI? Think you can already start thinking about it, dreaming about it, and and really engineering what does that mean for your campus. So I really think that this moment of like thinking is important to capture, but it isn't just about thinking, right? Because there's also actions that these institutions can take to really even engage serving this before they hit that designation. So for me, that, that is integral to, to think about how are institutions talking about this designation? How are they thinking about transformation? How are they uh, using data to, to inform their process as they become an HSI? I also would say that um, when I came to Davis back in 2014, we, we were an emerging HSI and that further really, for me, 
um, made it clear how important this was about intentionality. Because as I started to learn more about our campus, I learned that actually this idea of us being an emerging HSI had been on the radar since 2010. And that this meant that we needed to do better in terms of access and outreach earlier on. And so these have been conversations front and center at our campus for quite some time. And even though we haven't hit that federal designation yet, we were kind of constantly teetering um, in at that like really close to 25%. But regardless of that, we can still do things, we can still have conversations, and we can be thinking about intentionality in advance. So for me, those are some of the things that I've, I've learned in the process is that, um, there are things that institutions should be thinking about in advance. It isn't just kind of hitting this magic number. The work begins, you know, early on, um, especially because our, the designation is based on enrollment. And so there are things institutions can do to enhance that enrollment, to enhance that earlier on, to meet that designation. And um, I think that that in itself is a unique point of this dreaming, building, um, reimagining, really. Um, at, at an institution. Also, it's a point that institutions can bring various stakeholders together to say, what does this designation mean for us? Um, and this is what I've seen on our campus. When I first came in 2014, there were these open fora that the university was hosting about what does it mean for the institution to be an HSI? And it brought together faculty, staff, students, community members, alumni, in order to be part of that conversation, as well as, um, thinking about um, what are the things that we can start doing now, but also where do we want to be? So kind of that big picture thinking about these institutions. Absolutely. You got me thinking about how the emerging process is such an important planning process that there almost needs to be funding for that emerging piece, right? Like yes. there is no funding, there's no designation, but like that's the time for the the seed grants almost, right? Yes. yes, it can be, right? Because that is an important point where institutions can really actively think about what do we want to do how, and, and, and really who do we want to be when we become an HSI? And we know that that becoming or getting that designation isn't the end all, right? That's mm -hmm. just really the beginning of then doing yeah. the work in, in kind of new, new ways. But the work begins before that, or it mm -hmm. can begin before that especially for those institutions that are emerging HSIs. We know that some HSIs have been HSIs from their inception, whether that designation existed or not, right? So they've been doing the work. But for these other institutions that, that are in this kind of um, pre-phase, um, it is a moment of, 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 it's really, it can be a think tank, right? Of where mm -hmm. do we want to go and what can we do now? And really yeah. reimagining some of the structures of servingness in that pre pre-college phase. Absolutely. So anybody listening that has the power to make that happen, we, we just came up with a great idea. <laughs> that emerging state could be the state where, yeah, that's where the, the seed grants happen, right? And then, and to do all this thinking. Um, and like you said, you've been a part of this process even on your campus, right? In that emerging state and 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 what that looks like. And and you're not the first person to talk about the having the forum for, you know, for people, for community members, for families, for students, and, and just start talking, right? You got to start somewhere. Um, yes. And such an emerging, uh, an important part of that emerging process. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for that. Let's turn a little bit um, towards a different angle of your research. Um, so you and I just participated in this in this um, fellowship, right? It was it was a fellowship to help us think about how do we talk to policy folks and convince them to to embrace our work and and do things differently, right? And for me, I was like liberatory outcomes, right? Policy folks need to embrace the non normative academic outcomes. Um, and in reality, you've been writing about that since day one, right? I've been citing your work on that forever. Whenever I cite that non-academic or what I've been calling these days, right, liberatory outcomes, I, I'm often citing your work. You've yourself called them empowerment outcomes, right, and really elevated the fact that, that we can't 
solely rely on the normative academic outcomes like graduation as the only indicator of, of, of serving this, right? That there's other things that students get and should get when they go through college. So talk to us a little bit about um, your research around those outcomes and what you found and your, your thoughts on like the importance of elevating those outcomes as part of serving this. Yeah, so for me, the reason why these have always been so important is because they really cut to the heart in my mind always about, well, what is the purpose of what we're doing in higher ed, right? And so for me, when we think about that purpose, yes, part of that is of, of degree attainment and obviously um, enhancing the job force, but there's also um, in the field of higher ed historically, you know, higher education is tied to much more um, uh, what would be like democratically oriented elements of education, right? That this is a pathway for social mobility. But I think of social mobility, not just in the context of like economic and, and like job advancement, but also in terms of like position status in our society. And in order to kind of really feel that, for me, that's where these types of outcomes come in, right? In terms of, um, uh, I know that that, that you are, um, likely referencing a lot of like this academic self-concept, which is basically how do students perceive them as their own academic abilities? And for me, that becomes so important because um, when, when we graduate, if you're graduating with a degree, my hope would be that you are graduating with a sense of like, I'm pretty amazing and I can create change in this world. And so for me, because of, of, of the importance of, um, of, of, like feeling that in order to achieve like greater change and advancement in our society, we have to think about things that are broader than just degree attainment. And also I know that from research that academic self-concept or any notions of like critical consciousness, elements of, of those um, dimensions of, of, of a learner are also connected to those aspects of retention aspects to degree attainment. So these empowerment outcomes, liberatory outcomes are integral to those very outcomes that we care about or that policymakers often care about and institutions care about. So why wouldn't we expand our thinking to also include these elements as they are um, important, what we call intermediate outcomes, right? Like if you achieve these, these will lead to these other things, but in and of themselves, they are also in my mind, connected to the notions of what we say we value as the purpose of higher education, which is also kind of this notion of sustaining our democracy or advancing our democracy. And we know that at times we haven't quite lived up to that fully. And so because we know that we're still striving for that in our country, why wouldn't then we center these outcomes as part of the learning and what we value in, 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 in our educational enterprise? So for me, academic self-concept is integral to that. Also, this notion of like social agency or students um, um, desire to create change or to contribute to society. We often hear that from students themselves. And I know um, 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 this is, we see this, have seen this consistently in higher education research that Latinx students are driven by this community uplift, right? Wanting to give back to their communities, whether that be their family or their local communities. And so if we know that this is part of what students desire from their education, then at the core that is serving this, right? Giving them what they value. And it's also interconnected to these things that we value in our society. So again, if we value these things, why wouldn't we assess them? Why wouldn't we also reward institutions when they are centering these outcomes? So for me, that again, at the core, it's all about, well, what are we doing here? Um, and it's, to me, it's always been about more than just the degree. I talk about my experience at Stanford interconnected to this idea a, a lot because for me, it was transformative because it made me really realize I wanted to do more than just um, get a good paying job and do work, but to also do work that was rewarding and uplifting other students to have access to the things that I now had access to in higher ed. And so I think this is the story of many of our students. And because that is a story of many of our students and many of our Latinx communities, those that need to be central to this notion of serving this. Absolutely, beautifully stated. All these ideas of like the stuff that we actually say we value as higher ed, yet we, we don't um, 
we don't defer to them when it think about the success of the institution, right? It's like, yes. but we say we value these things, but it's not what is the final determinant of how well you're doing as an institution, right? Yes. Uh, but you're right. They're, they're mediator outcomes, right? Or intermediary outcomes that like, they're actually, I think a lot about like, that's easier to measure on a year to year basis, right? From like a grant perspective, right? Like a department of ed grant, you can much easier, easier report students had gains in these areas than six year graduation, right? Like, yes, that outlives the grant <laughs> six yes. years, you know, if, you're, if that's what you're going for. So I think we do have to spend more time. So we're going to be tweeting this episode out to all the, you know, Department of Ed uh, program officers and NSF officers, right? Like, because those outcomes are so vital to the ultimate outcome that that we really all care about, which is graduation, right? Yes. The, the, the yes. attainment of, of a degree. And like you said, jobs and going back in and, and serving communities is, is part of that, yes. you know, and can be considered one of those liberatory empowerment outcomes. Exactly. Exactly. And like, I think you captured it beautifully, right? We say we value these things. And so in in order to demonstrate that value, we should assess it, we should reward it when it's done Mm -hmm. well. And I would argue that um, HSIs for a long time have been doing many of these things very well. And those things should be front and center. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that was like, I know that that article, the first article that came out of your dissertation was my favorite to cite forever because it was like, you showed that, right? That HSIs are actually better at, at this, right? Like, and you had the data to show it, right? That eight students had this like higher level of, of self-efficacy at HSIs over the long term, right? Then students had non-HSIs. Uh, it's so powerful, right? To be able to say HSIs are doing really good work in these non-normative, uh, you know, non-academic outcomes that are, are really academic, right? That's why I stopped calling them non-academic. I'm like, that's a dumb name. <laughs> yes. We need a better name. Um, and yes. people love the liberatory out or, or empowerment, right? Yeah. Like that, that makes sense. Like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. While still being an outcome right? yeah. that, that's measurable. Yeah. And that this is really like, you know, this is where it goes back to our, our, our UCLA training, right? That this is at its core talent development, right? Mm-hmm. Really taking students from where they're coming in and saying, well, how are we as an institution advancing um, or supporting their success, right? And accounting for the assets that students bring in, but also recognizing that we can do some things to further enhance that by providing environments that um, allow them to dream bigger and really achieve those dreams in ways that they come in already wanting. So mm-hmm. I, I just say it's kind of like giving students what they're really looking for from this educational and, and mm-hmm. um, experience. Absolutely. Anybody that graduated from UCLA HEOC program right now is like, yep, they graduated from HEOC. <laughs> you can tell, right? Our, our, our training and our ped- pedigree, of course, you know, we we think in, in similar our terminology. Ways, right? <laughs> our terminology, yeah, for sure. Is, it's coming out pretty, pretty strongly. Um, and it's going to go right into this next question, which is connected to uh, your scholarship on campus climate, which, of course, our, you know, uh, uh, our scholar mama, I call her our scholar mama, you know, has written extensively about obviously about campus climate um, and you've centered it directly into HSIs and emerging HSIs, um, a piece that we need and a piece that doesn't get measured as not serving this, right? And that's part of the serving this framework. I'm like, if you're not, if you don't have a good campus climate, then you're not serving students, right? But that piece gets often overlooked. It's like, yeah, you know, that's on the side. We'll deal with that another time. But it can't be, right? It's got to be also part of this deep serving as conversation. So talk to us a little bit about that, about the importance of us continuing to examine the campus and particularly the campus racial climate um, at, at HSIs. Definitely. So again, for me, um, this came for me, or, or this has become for me, uh, really. Um, or it became very prevalent to me how important the campus climate was, again, in some interviews with students. And this, while we were studying campus climate um, in some of these studies, they were really kind of making these connections to like in the ways that the campus climate, because often we hear, right, the campus climate at HSI is very welcoming. And yes, we would expect it to be, especially when there's a greater representation of Latinx students on a campus environment. Students will send, will feel a greater sense of belonging because they see, right, community around them or folks that look like them around them. So we know that HSIs are 
uh, a, a, pot, a place where, where students can positively experience the campus environment. But what I was also learning or seeing in some of these narratives that um, students would share is that it's actually more complicated than that. Students may still continue to encounter racism, microaggression, microaggressions at HSIs. And so for me, centering that then gives us a place to say, okay, is that okay that students are still encountering these, these um, experiences on campus? And for me, that that's where um, it isn't just a, a blanket statement, right? It's, or, or as, as um, I believe it is Maria Ledesma says, there's not a binary campus climate. It's not either positive and it's not neither negative, right? And, and I think she, and I know she really also is arguing for how do we develop healthy climates, right? That are really healthy. And so for me, what I really want, wanted to center in this work was I was hearing this from students about still facing microaggressions, experiencing racism, um, whether they were experiencing that personally or observing it with some of their peers, that for me, then it became so important to say, okay, how do we hold that in addition to these positive parts? Because then that tells us we have work to still do. And for me, one of the, the things that I say in one particular piece um, is that our campus climate can either perpetuate the environment that students and our Latinx students experience outside of the university, or we can disrupt it. And so I, I would argue that most of us would, would make, if we're really going to engage serving this, we want to perpetuate the positive parts, but we should be disrupting the negative elements, the, the, the parts that racialize students, that microaggress students, that don't really challenge the status quo of what they're experiencing outside of campus. So for me, that's why that remains such an important part. What I will also mention is that um, for, for our campus a few years ago, when we published our, our UC HSI report, one of my colleagues, uh, Natalia Deep Sosa in the Chicano Studies Department, had these uh, forums where they were gathering data from students. They were gathering um, art performances to, to, to asking this question, what would it mean for our campus to really be an HSI? And campus climate was one of the top things. How do we enhance our campus climate so that I feel welcomed here? I feel empowered here. I feel like I am being supported and valued. So I think just listening to students, this becomes such an important part that still matters to them. And we know from research that campus climate is connected to retention because why would students necessarily want to stay in an environment where they're not feeling valued? Although many students may still do that, right? But I would say that if students graduate, even in environments that are toxic, that's not something the institutions did, that's something the student did, right? So we also need to honor that, right? That students are often resilient despite these environments, but that doesn't mean we should just be okay with that. I think we should then actively um, find ways to counter those things or find ways that we can ameliorate those campus climates to make them more, more positive and affirming for students moving forward. Absolutely. You just complicated it in so many levels. And shout out to Maria Ledesma, also a UCLA grad, <laughs> for giving us different frameworks to think about it, right? Like you're absolutely right. There's there's not, or she's absolutely right. There's not this binary. Um, but also I think your work in thinking about the context of the institution's climate versus the actual institution's climate is so important because students come in having experienced toxic terrible racialized climates in other places, including other educational spaces, in their mm -hmm. communities, in mm -hmm. their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And then the university can either perpetuate it or disrupt it, right? And mm -hmm. I think you you found some of that in some of your research is like, well, HSIs actually can, can be really good about disrupting what they're already experiencing in every other way. Why would we wanna keep perpetuating what our students are having to deal with in life? Mm -hmm. Right. In general, in dealing with toxic climates all over mm -hmm. the place. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I want to think a little bit about how your research can be used in practice by thinking about even your own um, time at UC Davis um, through this emergent process right, of becoming an HSI. How have you drawn on your own research um, 
in and put it into practice because you you've been able to do that right which is which is awesome to put your own research into practice and others right obviously but um talk to us a little bit about that to help people understand what that looks like to use the research to to advance your your practice around servingness so i would say part of it um for me or i I have the the privilege and opportunity to um sit on certain committees like our uc hsi task uh, sorry our uc davis HSI task force and also our implementation process. So back in 2019, the university published a, a, a report from the UC HSI task force. Um, and this uh, report really highlighted um, what we found from our own exploration on our campus in terms of talking to faculty, talking to students, talking to staff about areas that needed enhancement and what we would envision once we become an HSI. But as part of that was also integrating aspects of research, right? So one of the things that we made sure of is to make sure that we're framing um, students in asset-oriented ways, right? That even though we have work to do at the university, students are coming with talent and they're coming with assets and cultural wealth. And so making sure that we're not creating this deficit-oriented view through our HSI initiatives and really saying, okay, how are we going to build from what students come with and enhance that? And, and um, the, our leadership um, and really from our uh, associate vice, Chance- vice chancellor for academic diversity at that time, um, Raquel Aldana, really said, we're going to call our students rising scholars. They are emerging scholars, and we are just here to facilitate this learning process for them. So I think for me, like making sure that that asset-oriented language was integrated into our vision was important, and that comes from from our research on HSIs. As well, students told us that campus climate mattered. And so for us, that became part of one of the indicators of saying we need to have campus climate as a central indicator and saying our research Part, and part of my research is part of that, it is important to think about that. And, and also outcomes that are broader than just, I shouldn't say just degree attainment, but more than degree attainment and completion. How are we ensuring students are going to graduate school? Are we developing their aspirations? Are we facilitating their growth and, and, and development in that way? So thinking more than, than um, um, beyond degree attainment, and really thinking about their long-term trajectories. So, so for me, all of those things have been integral to that. And then we've also started an implementation phase uh, where uh, I've also been able to collaborate with other colleagues and other units on campus. So for instance, I, I, as part of this work, we, we have been um, supporting some of the ideas for like admissions and outreach. How can we better, um, support our students and families as they're learning about our campus. And we've actually been able to do some research given a research practice partnership that um, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Natalia Sosa, I and our, our uh, previous um, diversity outreach um, director to come up with ideas of how do we research some of the things that we've done in the past and how can we learn from that to better engage our servingness on our campus. So I think that that's another way too, that practitioners can think about partnering with faculty on the campus, right? And and that want to support these initiatives. And while we may have different, um, you know, our, for, for me, for instance, like what matters is research, right? That's what I'm going to be valued and assessed on, but I want my research to be meaningful and to serve the institution. And so there's ways that we can actually meet intersecting goals through these kinds of partnerships. So I also think, or I've been thinking a lot about how can universities foster these kind of collaboratives on the campus that bring together faculty, that bring together staff, that bring together students in order to produce scholarship that not only will be, you know, uh, published, but that will really also inform and guide the university moving forward. So I kind of see that also happening um, in some of the work that I've been able to do here at the university. Yeah, absolutely. So powerful. I love it. I'm a little bit like, 
my heart hurts. I don't get to do that same work, right? Because I don't work at an HSI or even emerging HSI. Um, but so cool to be able to to engage in your research as praxis, right? Like really moving it and working with so many folks who are committed to it too, right? You you named some of those folks who are who are committed to doing this work too. So um, super exciting, and I'm excited to see what else uh, it's going to come out of UC Davis um, as y'all continue to, to you know to go on your serviness um, journey. Yes, and if I could put a quick plug, we actually yeah. had a, a journal, an article published um, uh, earlier this academic year in Education Sciences, talking about how our university um, either supported or did not support our institutional agents who were during the COVID nineteen pandemic when we shifted everything virtually and they were providing kind of these these um, uh, or not for, I'm sorry, these workshops for parents to learn about our university mm-hmm. for those students that were admitted, you know, the ways that our institution was supporting, but also not supporting them. So again, part of our, our serving this journey is to say, what are we doing well and how can we do better? But, but specifically what we value about this piece is that it centers our institutional agents at our university, our Latinx staff that for years have been doing this work um, supporting students. And so um, I can um, share that with you if you don't have that listed already. Um, mm-hmm. But that is a piece that's part of this partnership that we developed. And, and but my co-authors there are Dr. Natalia Di Sosa, Dr. Blas Guerrero, and one of our graduate students, uh, Mayra Nunez Martinez, and also an undergraduate that was able to publish with us part, as part of this work and really thinking deeply about how we can continue to learn about what we've done well and what we're not doing well, especially Mm. in this COVID after this pandemic Mm -hmm. and how we can continue to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. We can drop that in the show notes. So give it, give me that citation. Cause we, um, yeah, would love to learn. And I, and I love open access journals, uh, and education sciences is so that that's great that y'all are producing right in ways that where people can access um, the knowledge. Yes. So other than that, because that sounds like current stuff um, for the fans of your work, what other things are you cooking up in the lab that we can expect to come out um, or, or stay, stay engaged and wait for um, to drop in the near future? So, um, you know, when, it's not going to come out in the near future, but pretty soon, I hope. Um, but, but I will say that we're going to be presenting at ASH, the Association for the Study of Higher Education, in November for anyone who may be um, attending. But right now, uh, we've, we've been doing some research as a, a, as a collaborative. Um, Dr. Francis Contreras at UC Irvine and Dr. Juan Bolet at UC Santa Cruz and myself here at UC Davis. We've actually been thinking about what does it mean for our institutions to be at this intersection of being an R1 and also an HSI. And so we, we've been thinking deeply about that. And so we have, we're actually presenting a session at ASH where we really are centering kind of three different conceptual approaches to think about this. And so the part that I'm uh, contributing to this conversation is um, really thinking deeply about, well, how have has um, research on institutions at this intersection? What do we know so far? What are they covering? And, and we have found that there's actually been a substantial amount of work now coming out on these institutions that are at this intersection. And so what we're highlighting here in this conceptual piece is to say, this is what we know, but this is where we need to go moving forward, recognizing the history of R1 universities and especially um, centering this in, in a conversation about UCs specifically, but what do we need to learn from our own history as R1s? And what does this mean as we engage in our serving this journey and really a, a, a journey of transformation, right? Of, of R1s as being elite historically and have excluded for a large part Latinx populations and other minoritized populations. And so how does this HSI identity allow us to reimagine, allow us to transform structures that not only just enroll more of these students, because again, like you said, Gina, powerfully, we we would have to really try hard not to (laughs) enroll these students eventually, right? Given the state of California's demographics. But then what does that mean about how we change these cultures that have been exclusionary, that have been elitist in a lot of ways and perpetuate that in the culture. And so I'm excited about this. This is one of the things that um, um, in the near future, I'm, I'm excited to, to move forward. I'm also working on another project that is, is 
I haven't centered it as much on HSIs, but it, but, but I know that it needs to be. But I'm also doing a study right now where I'm um, interviewing Latinas community college students to understand how they make decisions about college going, right? Oftentimes, our research does not include community college students and understanding their decision making. But right now in this moment where we've seen drastic drops in enrollment at the community college and in, in, in our Latinx community, I think it's important to center the, the perspectives of students and what are the things that support them as they're making decisions about where they're going to start their community college journey. And so I'm centering this in a particular region and understanding how they make their community college choices in this region when they have multiple options in a region. And, and, and so far what, what I'm learning is that a lot of it has to do with, well, what are those institutions doing to inform students about the opportunities available? Do those institutions have institutional agents that are actively engaging students? And so that is another one that um, in the near future, I hope to, to put forward. And we will be publishing a report um, that, that uh, details the college going patterns for Latinx students across the state by county. So that we also provide more data to, to um, different uh, parts of our state about, well, where are the Latinx students in your, in your service region? Where do they go? And um, what can we learn from this to create policy change and better support students, whether that be at the state level, the system level or at the individual campus level. Awesome, thank you for sharing those um, previews. I'm excited about the intersection of HSI and research institution. I will be front and center at that ASH, ASH session um, because I haven't thought deeply about it, uh, but I've written about it a little bit in my upcoming book. It's a little bit, a little sliver, but it's 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 a very under, um, developed area, right? So I'm so glad y'all are doing that work and from the place where it needs to be done, which is HSRIs, right? Um, or HSRUs, which I'm going to get to in a second. Um, but definitely, um, you know, that's an important piece. The community college piece, you, I thought about something important. You said, um, you know, I'm working with, with Latinas in community colleges and their college going, it's not HSI centered. I think that's an important thing to acknowledge because, you know, not all research has to be HSI, even if it's at an HSI, right? Because we do this like deep analysis around HSIs and serviness, which is what really needs to be done, right? When it comes to HSI. And if you're not going to do that deep analysis, then it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're looking at community colleges and that work needs to be done too. So, um, so I, I don't think it has to be HSI research, but if it is, <laughs> of course, I'm going to cite it. <laughs> But I think it's so important, right? Because we're, we're, you know, we can't force people into like doing HSI research just because it happens to be at an HSI. It's not exactly. enough. Exactly. And I think that that's something um, that we need to really like emphasize, right? Like it's doing HSI work, work is really centering, right? The institution and saying, mm -hmm. what can the institution do better? And so I think now speaking to students, I'm realizing like, oh no, they're calling out these things that need to be done. And so for me, that's also helping me think through like, okay, yes, like this is about serving this mm -hmm. um, from their perspective, right? And mm. so anyhow, more, I'll think about that more deeply, but I think you're right, Gina. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the UCHSI initiatives, which you've mentioned, um, but I want to know a little bit more um, how you've been involved with some of that work um, and or some of the work just for folks that aren't aware that the UC at a UC, you know, University of California level is in, uh, thinking about HSI pretty deeply and, and, and has been right for several years already. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you've been involved with those initiatives and what's going on in the UC with HSIs. Yeah, so, so this really has been a, a system-wide effort supported by the UC Office of the, of the Provost and also the, uh, the UC Office of Diversity Engagement. And so what this initiative does is brings together representatives from each of our um, campuses across the system to have conversations about HSI. How are campuses enacting serving this through their initiatives? Also, what are things that challenges that we're encountering and how can we support our sister campuses in this work and learn from each other? So it really has been um, 
a, a, a place of deep learning. And I know, Gina, you've come to present at one of the annual uh, retreats uh, where we've brought together not only the leadership team or the advisory board that, that serves to support these efforts, but really brings leaders from across each of the campuses to learn more. And, and really um, what I recall from when you presented back, I wanna say it was 2019 when you came, um, in really to say like a call to action, right? To say, we really need to think about serving this deeply, not just kind of at the enrollment and surface level, but what are we doing to really change our, our institutions. And so, so this, this initiative is a forum or a platform for us to think about that deeply. So I've been fortunate to um, uh, sit on the advisory board um, and, and there's, there's monthly calls where we call in and listen in to what's happening on the various campuses. And then also think about what are the system-wide things that we can do to showcase and learn from each other about what is happening on the individual campuses. So a few years ago, we had a showcase at UC Santa Cruz where all of the different representatives from the universities, from the, from the system came to the campus and they showcased their HSI uh, journey with us. And we learned so much about how do you really engage and begin to transform through the various um, um, grants that they've received and really think deeply about this. And so it's so, and, but it also brings together um, um, an opportunity to connect network and really support not only individual campuses, but really have the system level view. And so I think that we need to do more of this kind of work at other uh, systems that have many HSIs. So we have uh, right now five federally designated undergraduate HSIs and, and the rest are emerging HSIs and so they will be HSIs in the near future. And so they are intentionally thinking about what does this mean for our individual campuses, but that we also need to share resources and support each other given um, the similarities, some of the similarities in our mission as UCs, but also the nuances, right? Each of our campuses have their own culture, have their own you know, flavor, and so have their different regional needs. And so how can we also think about those and learn from each other? So that's been really um, pivotal for us to think bigger, right? In order to serve our mission, um, again, not just as an individual campus, but as part of a system that supports the, the knowledge generation in our state, in the country, in the world, and also supports our, 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 our state's needs. Absolutely. It sounds like it's completely informing your, your, your research, right? Like about with the HSI and the research, right? Like what is the UC's role in being an HSI? And it should look different than the Cal States or the community colleges or any other HSI beyond, outside of the UC. Mm -hmm. right. Definitely. And, and all of that's informed right, by our mm -hmm. state policy, right? How mm -hmm. our universities have been historically designed to meet um, interrelated but different missions. And so we need to think deeply about what does this mean for our mission? And some of it will converge with the other systems, right? Because we are all here to serve the residents of our state, serve our state and enhance success of, of, of our um, students and their families and our communities, but there's also parts of our, our mission that are fundamentally different, and we also have very different histories. There's mm -hmm. also different funding mechanisms, right? So, so there are things that are nuanced within our own systems that uh, the system-wide effort allows us to talk across the campuses that are most like us, but also kind of um, think about um, uh, nuances. Another thing that I think is important to really start to think about is how to connect HSIs regionally, mm -hmm. right? Because so many of our Latinx mm -hmm. students want to go to school where their families are. Mm -hmm. And so how can we think regionally about supporting our students? And I know that there are efforts throughout our state, at least, that are building some of these regional partnerships. And so how can we support those partnerships? So put that for policymakers as well, right? How do we support more of these partnerships yes. and really facilitate that we are serving these communities and that we are creating pathways for students to transfer if they do, if they started a community college, transfer to the local institutions and that we are then um, 
for instance, as you see, is then creating pathways within our region for, for students when they want to go to graduate school. How are we working with our local region and interconnecting with our various um, partners? So I think that's another important area to really uh, work intersegmentally, right, across mm -hmm. different segments of our higher ed system. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that leads right into my next question, because I think the idea of like us needing to start to think about HSI's distinct sort of um, affinity groups, I guess we'll call them, right? I mean, there's almost 600 HSI's. Like it's hard to say that all 600 are gonna come together and do anything, right? But these like pockets, right? They could be regional based um, consortia. They could be state based. They could be a lot of different things. Well, we've just seen in the last couple of weeks, right? Right, the announcement of of, a, of an emergence of an alliance of Hispanic serving research universities, HSRUs. Although we did originally call those HSRIs, right? <laughs> um, shout out to Patricia Marin, who, who definitely coined that term. Um, but they're saying HSR our youth, and there's 20 of them that are part of this alliance for now, because there's going to be more, right, that emerge. Um, and that's an interesting sort of affinity group, right, because of, of what's wrapped up in being R1s, right, in HSIs. Um, so tell me, what are your thoughts on, on the emergence of this type of alliance? Is it, is it important? What, what are your thoughts? I, I think, you know, kind of building on, on how I was mentioning about the UCHSI initiative being important, right, to talk to campuses that are, you know, hold similar missions and, and face similar challenges um, as, as our own is important, right? And I like this idea that it is like an affinity group, right? Like there you could talk through and, and really talk real about the issues that you that you face. And so I think, you know, for me, like this is uh, an important an important alliance because it does center or connect these institutions that are at this unique intersection, right? Historically, they've, they, they, they've not um, necessarily enrolled the largest number of minoritized student populations, but, are, but obviously have made strides and have made a lot of investments in that with this HSI designation. And I think also what makes this unique is that it gets to center graduate students, right? in a much more intentional way, which, you know, graduate students are not in that HSI, you know, definition, or, or, or at least for the, in the designation itself, right? It's based on undergraduate enrollment, but some of your work has really centered how at R1 University specifically, that our HSIs, we've seen really a decline, right? In terms of, of the number of Latinx graduate students relative proportion relative to the undergraduate population. And so knowing that oftentimes graduate students are an important uh, starting point or point of connection for many of our undergrads because they're often TAs, often willing to mentor students and that matters, right? Really deeply for us to think about graduate students. And I think this alliance allows for these institutions to speak to those that are going to be grappling with very similar challenges and thinking, well, what, how do we overcome those challenges? What have other institutions done to transform those, um, those uh, structures that may be limiting access? Um, and so, so that to me is really exciting. And the fact that they've committed, right, to doubling the number of Latinx graduate students, doctoral students, I believe specifically, also increasing the representation of Latinx faculty in their institutions. And so for me, I think that that is a bold commitment and that's great, right? That they've given themselves to 2030 to achieve these goals. And so, um, you know, they can think about that and chat with each other again and share best practices. And I think that I, I just would really love to see, you know, as they move forward, that how do they think about supporting students, right? So it isn't just about having more Latinx faculty and having more doctoral students, but then how are they supporting them once they are there? Are they, you know, are they providing resources? Are they um, also working to retain the graduate students that they have now, the Latinx faculty that they have now? And are they supporting those faculty also through the, faculty ranks, right? So not just thinking about pre-tenure to tenure, but what about those associate professors? Are we supporting them to get to full? Are we then retaining those professors, like once they get tenure and um, keeping them um, serving as 
the the outstanding resources that they are. I also, you know, kind of would love to see them think about or or, or see what comes from this work about how R ones HSR use HSRIs are innovating knowledge production. Right at the core, that is our mission. We are knowledge producers. So how are we re re imagining knowledge production connected to our HSI identity. So that's something that, you know, um, I, I think I would love to see moving forward as well. Absolutely. And how knowledge is valued, right, in those institutions, because it should look different, the production, the valuing of it. Yes. I think you bring up a lot of good points. Of course, my critical brain immediately was like, what about the not selective research HSIs, which really was the original intention, right, of the HSI designation was to support under-resourced broad access, right, historically broad access institutions. So, so I struggle with that because I think everything you said is like absolutely these institutions can really do some good with the critical lens. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anyone listening that's part of the alliance, please do this work critically, because otherwise it's going to reinforce hierarchical structures of higher ed. Right. Which me and you both know and worry about happening within HSIs. Mm -hmm. But I think that you raise an important point um, to Gina here. Right. So you're talking about those HSIs that are um, high research activity universities, mm -hmm. right, based on the Carnegie classification, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that that also then becomes an important research agenda or maybe even um, uh, either agenda or maybe, I, I don't know, maybe another affinity group that mm. collectively comes together to, to, to elevate the work that they've been doing for right. a long time as well. Right. I wonder if the R2s are going to ever be invited. <laughs> they were very distinct that it was R1, <laughs> which is also like, okay, you know, that, that, that become, it became a very, um, elite alliance group, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Um, although I did appreciate that the goals, immediate goals as well of like graduate students and faculty. So immediately yes. those goals to me were like, those were important. Those are important goals. So, yeah. And I think those goals matter, but, but also, right. Like it, it kind of like where our conversation has always been, you can't just be about enrolling these populations or recruiting these populations, but then how are you actually serving them once they are there and yeah. ensuring their success, right? So that's the part too that I uh, look forward to seeing, right? Like how do structures change? How do values change, right? To really reflect the, yeah. um, um, the, the, the wonderful Latinx doctoral students and faculty that they will, you know, be serving. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to ask you about um, this special, I know it's, we're not supposed to call it a special issue. So special topic <laughs> on HSI, ARA Open is very specific about, it's a special topic because they're not all in the same issue um, on intersectionality and HSIs. Um, several of the guests on, on Que Pasa HSIs actually were authors in that. Um, what an exciting um, time, right, for us to do that work. It was, it, was, it was a beautiful moment for me and I was so glad you were a part of it. So what were your, what are your thoughts or what are your plugs on on that special topic as it's you know we're, we're wrapping it up right with the final article coming out soon yeah so first of all I want to thank you Gina for for as you are with many things the mastermind of this like wonderful idea to put to center intersectionality at HSIs and when uh, you invited me to to um come on to this uh, collaborative, I just, it was a, an immediate yes, because you, I think are centering or your vision for this really was about complicating, like you, we say in the in the open call, the H in HSIs, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. how do we think more deeply about um, our Latinx student populations, whether that be faculty, students, um, the context that institutions are in, right? The regional differences that may exist, the state differences that may exist. And so for me, what's been exciting is seeing these ideas that, that uh, individuals um, propose to us and then seeing that work come through to fruition, right? From beginning mm -hmm. to end mm -hmm. and really engaging so many emerging scholars in this endeavor, right? So we have a lot of uh, uh, um, contributors who contributors who really are across the nation, but also really are using different methodologies, mm -hmm. are centering different elements of intersectionality. Some are very much focused at the individual level. Some are grappling with kind of these more institutional level 
um, um, factors. And then there's a few that are kind of spanning or calling across intersectionality across all of these domains that um, Anne-Marie Nunez and her outstanding intersectionality framework really kind of details and outlines. And so for me, I think that folks um, should be looking forward to reading, you know, the, uh, well, they've already been reading, right? Because we uh -huh. have several of the articles already published and we're just waiting for one more. But I just really um, have, um, appreciated the way that all of these scholars have kind of pushed our thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Have really pushed into new areas. Not that these areas are necessarily new for students who have experienced the things that they are describing or institutions, but that they're um, documenting these and really providing us with a sense of one, how do we study these um, topics in, in ways that are humanizing and really uh, empowering but also how do we then push even further, right? That this is just the starting point. So mm -hmm. for me, that's what I'm really excited about to see the, the where this work's gonna go moving forward, not only in terms of research, but also how institutions and practitioners are going to take this knowledge and create um, mm -hmm. changes based on it. So, so um, it's exciting to, to, to say the least. Um, and I'm looking forward to, for us to also uh, wrap up our opening introduction, mm -hmm. which now I, you know, I, I just really am excited about this work. Yeah, for sure. Me too. It's been, it's been a really fun process, but also the, the work that came out of it. You're right. The scholars that showed up and wrote these amazing articles, uh, thoughtful, critical, empirically driven articles are just, we really, we, we lucked out, right? We got, we got a great group of, of authors. So, so everybody download those articles. We're going to try to be the most downloaded special topic. Yes. <laughs> I think we yes. can. I think we can. Yeah. We'll yes. keep pushing it. <laughs> yes. And please do share with us too, well, you know, how you maybe take that knowledge and mm -hmm, apply yeah. it right to your own campuses and um, maybe contribute to, to publications, right, in, mm -hmm. in documenting that work so that others can learn about how, how you can, again, engage in practice, right, taking this research into practice and reflecting and learning from it. Absolutely. So the final question, sometimes the hardest question for the people that showed up, because they want to know what's happening in HSIs. How do you respond to that? ¿Qué pasa, HSIs? So for me, I would say, like, I, I really think that this is an exciting moment, HSIs, um, and all of you at HSIs. I really, one of the things that I like to think about right now is that I think HSIs can and will serve as the models of excellence for the next hundred, if not longer years of higher education in this country. Um, I think that all of the work that our HSIs have been doing, have continued to do through the pandemic to serve our Latinx students, our Latinx communities, really points to just the, the um, commitment, dedication that we have to uplift, right? And to serve. Our, our missions. And so for me, I'm excited about what that looks like moving forward, right? That we can think that what we're building now will be what other others will look at models of excellence and that HSIs I've always have envisioned in that way of really being what we should be striving to do in terms of really grappling with change and better serving um, the population of students that we have. Absolutely. It's an exciting time. And we got great folks, you know, really pushing um, some great work. So thank you for that. And thank you. Muchas gracias for being a guest on Que Pasa HSI's. Dr. Acuayar, my, my HSI sister, my hermana en la lucha. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for dreaming this, Gina. And I look forward to um, everything that's going to come from this podcast and learning from your other guests. And also just keep keep learning from you and your brilliance and, and um, building together. I hope that this, this um, special topic issue that we have is just the start <laughs> of another thing that mm -hmm. we will be able to collaborate and dream together. Absolutely. Absolutely.